Good morning, AP Physics. Uh, we are looking at September 1st right now, um, finishing up Chapter 3, starting Chapter 4, and your test on Chapters 2 through 4 is on the 10th. Um, hopefully you're getting ready. We're kind of moving really today's an important one because we're doing two of the big sections on your chapter test because there will be a three-part problem on up and down and a two-part problem on projectile motion. So really we're looking at possibly approaching 40% of your test score is just today's notes alone. So um, anyway, hopefully it all makes sense. It should. I don't think this is too difficult. Um, so we also need to go over the homework assignments that were from sections uh, on gravity, two sections on gravity, so chapter three, homework numbers three and four. I'll start with that. Questions 11 and 12 kind of go together, Re trying to see if we can recognize a, a pattern to what's happening. An object is dropped from a height of 50 meters. How long will it take to hit the ground? And number 12, an object is dropped from double that height, 100 meters. How long will it take to hit the ground? So in both of these, the givens that we have have here in the problem, we do have to kind of, you know, infer a couple of them that VI is zero and that A is 9.8 meters per second squared since they only gave us a distance and asked us a time. Recognize these are free fall problems. And so we're going to use the equation S equals VIT plus one half AT squared. I'm going to put up both answers here for questions 11 and 12 at the same time so we can see that in question number 12, even though the height was doubled, the time did not double, and that's because of the quadratic nature of this equation. You could almost think of it as if question number 12, instead of saying an object is, is dropped from a height of 100 meters, what if instead the problem had said an object is dropped from a, an object is thrown, I don't know where to write this, so let's just put this over on the side here, thrown downward, um, at a speed of 50 meters per second from a height of 50 meters. Can you see that that is really the answer we're getting from this for this one? So from a height of 50 meters, because in problem number 11, for the object to fall the first 50 meters, if it's picking up speed at a rate of 10 meters per second every second, ah, see, I already screwed that up. It wouldn't be from 50 meters. Um, it would be, by the height is correct. What is wrong is it's not going to be thrown at a speed of 50 meters per second. It's going to be thrown at a speed of 32 meters per second. Let me repeat that whole thing in case I just confused you, had to have confused you. In 50 meters, it takes 3.2 seconds. Based on this equation, VF equals VI plus AT, that means that every second it's speeding up by 10 meters per second uh, per second. So in 3.2 seconds, it should now have reached a speed of 32 meters per second. I hope that makes sense. It needs to make sense. Then uh, if we take a second problem and instead of dropping it from 100, let's already have it having traveled the first 50 meters is like it's thrown at 32 meters per second straight down from a height of 50. If you now use the same equation, S equals 32 times Oh, I'm not even going to put S. We know that it's 50. Now, we can't solve this because it's a quadratic. We need fancy calculators to do that, which you have, but I don't. VIT plus 1 half AT squared. And you solve this when you're done. Um, we're going to get the T is another 1.3 seconds. Okay, so I'm kind of beating this up, but I just want you to recognize the relationship between all of our equations and the problems and how everything kind of fits together because the AP test is not going to ask you a question about how far something drops, how long it takes. They're going to ask you something conceptual about how this all works together. So what I just brought up over here on the, in, in the side in blue, um, just be aware of that thought process. Same with this one, uh, questions 14 and 15 tie together in number 16. When we have something drop for 1.3 seconds versus 2.6 seconds, the distance isn't double, that the distance is uh, a lot smaller. I mean, just slightly more for number 15 than number 14, because in that second half, the second 1.3 seconds, um, 
it already was moving with some speed so it covered greater distance in that time i don't know i'm kind of messing up on the way i'm saying this but i think if, yeah see I, I said that backward that it's really that it covers more distance ah see that was a really bad mess up but here's something where i can do to fix myself you guys just did a free fall lab that is due should be due this week right so you did the free fall lab and that would be due uh wednesday tomorrow so uh one of the things that you had in that lab was to graph distance versus time and then i told you to make a best fit line that looks like a, a half a parabola the quadratic nature of the fact that as the time goes from 1.6 1.3 up to 2.6 that it's not a linear increase in distance that the amount of distance was only to here in 1.3 seconds but then at 2.6 the distance has gone up to here. So you haven't gone up in equal increments. So hopefully that just covered what I just screwed up saying before I put this, these slides up. That's the kind of questions the AP test will ask. Is they'll ask something to the effect of when the time doubled, what happened to the distance? And you recognize that it's a quadratic, that it's going to go up exponentially. The second assignment, question 17 through 20, at what speed would you hit the floor if you stepped off a chair 0.5 meters tall? Same thing, plugging in because they gave us a height and they asked us for a speed this time instead of a time, we use this equation, 3.1 meters per second. Uh, when we get to momentum and impulse, we recognize why we bend our knees because if you're reaching about eight miles per hour, uh, the combined speed plus your weight would blow out your knees if you kept your legs straight. So we need to have a way to absorb that force with time, but we haven't talked about force yet. Question 18, if a stone is dropped, not thrown from a bridge and it takes 3.7 seconds to hit the water, how high is the rock dropper? Yeah. Great phrasing by your textbook. Um, same things we've been doing. Question number 19, this is a nice segue into today's notes because instead of us dropping something for free fall, now we're looking at the speed something is the initial speed of an object that jumps upward, takeoff speed, as they called it here in number 19, uh, to find out how, uh, what kind of speed is required to get to a height of 2.5 meters. So looks like our variables still match up to the VF squared equation. And so when you plug that in and solve for the initial speed, every, you can see how everything fits together. We get seven meters per second. And then if we were in class, we would actually do this one for fun. Um, I hold a ruler near somebody who sits in the front between their fingers and I ask them to catch it. I release it and they catch it. And usually they catch it pretty close to the end of the ruler. So then we repeat with a dollar bill. And then when I release it, most times, maybe one time in 20 years, has somebody actually caught the dollar bill. Everybody else, it's the uh, response time. You can't do it because things fall quickly due to gravity. You can try that one at home though. All right, chapter 3.4 and 4.1 are today's notes. Um, I have seen on an AP multiple choice uh, test where they ask something about what is the acceleration of gravity when an object was at the top. And the way they word the problem is tricks the students into wanting to pick that there's that everything's zero when you get to the top. Know that no matter what happens to an object, just like we said in the notes last time we met, Whatever an object is doing, gravity is always accelerating it downward at 9.8 meters per second squared. Now, if you're concerned about how do you deal with that when the ball is still in the person's hand, yes, there is still an acceleration of gravity that is 9.8, but we don't see any acceleration because there's no net force acting on the object right now. When it's in the person's hand, they're, they haven't thrown it upward yet. We would say that gravity is pulling down on it. So we haven't learned about forces yet. And that there's a force of the person's hand. We're going to have a special name for that next chapter. We're going to call it the normal force. So the normal force and the gravitational forces are canceling each other out. Because of that, this acceleration, while it still exists, there is no motion to give us any actual movement of the object. But just know that at all times, there's an acceleration vector of 9.8 meters per second squared pointing straight down. Okay, so as the object goes up, that's why it's slowing down, it gets to its highest point, then it's going to turn around and then the vectors for velocity and acceleration point the same direction. 
So I might change the name to positive 9.8 meters per second squared as it speeds it back up. And there's symmetry to the problem. Okay, so we have an, uh, a question here that we're going to solve it. We're going to look at the symmetry to the problem um, for the up and down. But otherwise, as of right now, before we uh, get into the symmetry of this whole problem, couldn't we just start by saying this is just like the kangaroo problem, right? If you, it's just that instead of solving for the speed, we're going to solve for the, the peak altitude, what height it reaches. So my variables that I know here are that it was initial speed of 30 meters per second was what it was released at. It's being slowed by gravity until it reaches its maximum height where its speed has reached the speed of zero. So the variables we have here match up nicely to us using the equation. So we'll call this part A. Vf squared equals Vi squared plus 2As at the top, zero. At the bottom, 30 plus 2 times negative 9.8 times S. Plug all that into our calculator and we get 46 meters. Okay, so now we know what maximum height it reaches. Then the second part says, part B, how fast does it come back down to the shooter? Okay, so where my object is located at all of these steps here is really that the object is started out in the person's hand right there. So this would be at T initial, T equals zero. Then maybe we could say at T equals one, it's right here, at T equals two. Now I, we, I know the times probably don't match up. We know the times don't match up to perfectly, you know, me saying T1, T2, T3, all the way up. But let's just, for the sake of argument, keep it that way so we can see the symmetry of the problem. So this is T1, this is T2, this would be T3, this would be T4, and then we'll call it, when it finally comes to a stop, T5, okay? And then T5 really is the same thing because it comes to a stop, it just momentarily comes to a stop, comes back down. So then this would be T6. Now notice how T4 and T6 line up with each other where the ball is at. What's different is the velocity vectors are pointing opposite directions. So I don't line up the vectors side by side with each other. That would be nice looking on the picture. But the, the truth is T6 and T4, while the ball is at the same location, the vectors point the opposite way. T3 and T7, the ball is at the same location, there's symmetry, but the speeds, which are equal, are in opposite direction. T8 and T2, ball is at the same height, but the velocity vectors equal, but point opposite direction. T9, and then we could call this one T10. And so can you see there that at T10 and T0, we have the same speed, opposite directions, we have the same location. And so there's the symmetry of this problem. Why am I going into such detail? Because this picture is on your test without the vectors and you have to draw them in. And so when you put the ball at the first spot here, we'll call this the T1 spot. And over here, let's call this the T9 spot. All I have is the picture like that. When you draw the vectors, I don't want to see this and this. That's not how we draw vectors. Vectors always come out of the object that is uh, that they're representing. So the velocity vector, we'll call that one V1, and the velocity vector V9, they're equal and opposite to each other because of the symmetry of the problem. It's just that they don't look the same because they're like offset of each other the entire time. Keep that in mind. That is a test question. I do take off points. All right. So because of that, that was a long explanation for what we can say about T10 down here at the bottom, this V that goes with that. The symmetry of this problem says... It slows down till it gets to a zero speed. Then the symmetry does exactly the same thing in the opposite direction. So its speed when it gets back to the shooter's hand is the same speed it started. So we can say V at the bottom, I probably have it on the next slide, is equal to 30 meters per second. Um, I wasn't old enough to witness this. My brother told me the story when I was older that at some point in time, around 10 to 12 years old, my parents get my brother his first real bow and arrow, right? So the real ones that you could actually hurt somebody with. So he's in the backyard of our house. Um, I suppose I would have been just like anywhere between zero and three years old, because he's about 10 years older than me. So I would have been in the house, thank goodness. He's in the backyard and he's shooting his bow and arrow straight up in the air. And back then our trash cans were metal. 
So he's got the metal trash can lid and he's holding it like a, a shield. So he'd shoot it in the air and sit here like this and wait. And then the arrows would come and land in the grass in the backyard. He'd do it again, do it again, do it again. Till finally, one of the arrows, as he's sitting there, goes right through the trash can lid, through a metal trash can lid right in front of his face, right next to his arm. And, you know, so of course, then he stopped doing it. But the obvious thing is, if, you know, imagine just taking a trash can lid, setting it right in front of you and pulling that arrow or the bow back and releasing that arrow, that's the speed more or less. Now there is some air resistance, so its speed is going to be a little bit less, but that's the speed that it comes back at. Okay. Um, if you're enjoying stories, there's a good Mythbusters about shooting guns in the air. And one of the things that they talk about is, you know, in order for us to keep a bullet traveling with accuracy, we want it to rifle. So it spins like a football spins with a spiral. If you shoot a bullet straight up in the air and it gets to the top of its path, if it falls out of its path and tumbles downward, it'll actually hit the ground at a speed that I think you could catch it. It's going to be so slow. But if that bullet is able to actually turn itself around and start to spiral on its way back down, now it becomes lethal. And that's why we don't shoot guns up in the air, um, why it's illegal. Um, so all about the air resistance is an issue, but neglecting air resistance, the speed that it is released at is the speed that it comes back at because of the symmetry of the problem. How long does the whole trip take? I don't really have an equation that will solve for the entire trip's time, but the symmetry of the problem says the time it takes to get to the top equals the time it takes to get to the bottom. So why don't we just solve for the time it takes to get to the top? We'll call that T to the top. And we'll use the equation based on what I see here. To me, I like the equation VF equals VI plus A times T. So 0 equals 30 plus 9.8 times T. This is one of those cases where just rounding it to 10 seems like a good idea. So we can say T to the top equals 3. Um, I probably have the answer on the next slide, so I might as well just use what I have there, 3.1. Then that means then that the time down is also 3.1. So add those two together and you get 6.2. In regular physics, they get extra credit if they put 6.2 as the total time. You're not at regular physics, are you? So be ready that on your test, if you don't give me the total time, you will lose points. Draw the velocity and acceleration vectors on the diagram. So everywhere that we see the object, you already can see the velocity vectors up and down. The only thing I'm, that I didn't put was I didn't put the acceleration vector pointing down there. That's missing out of the picture. And notice that the vectors are the same. There's an AP multiple choice question out there that somehow convinces the students when it gets to the top that the acceleration is zero, right? Because the way the question is worded, no matter where it is, the acceleration is always 9.8. Um, this is a hard one. Question number two, a ball is hurled straight up at a speed of 15 meters per second, leaving the hand of the thrower two meters above the ground. Compute the times and the ball's speeds when it passes an observer in the window in line with the throw 10 meters above the point of release. Okay, actually three parts of this are easy. There's just one part of this that is incredibly difficult, which is what time does it get to the observer on the way back down? The easy question is, uh, what time does it get to the observer on the way up? Because really all we need to say is, if it's released here with an initial speed, 15 meters per second, it's going to rise up, get to the observer at some particular time, be traveling at some speed. It's going to keep going up, maybe. I mean, we don't know for sure. Maybe that's the top of the path. That would actually make this a lot easier. It won't be that easy. Then it's going to turn around and come back down. Okay. And, and see, I'm just putting the vector side by side. I shouldn't do that because if I'm not going to let you get away with that on your test, I shouldn't get away with that in my problem either, that it would look like this would be a, a better representation all the way down, okay? So that those vectors are supposed to be equal and opposite to each other at each point where the ball is. So the ball is equal and opposite vectors here, equal and opposite direction vectors here, equal and opposite direction vectors here, 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 and then of course here it was just at the top. Okay. So let's start with finding out how fast it's going when it gets to the uh, person 10 meters above. Looks to me like I know the initial speed. I know the uh, distance. I know, of course, that the acceleration. 
is negative 9.8. And I want to know what was I starting with? How much time or distance? Uh, speed. I'm going to start with speed. The reason why I'm going to start with speed, so V here, maybe, I don't know, let's just put V question mark. Uh, reason I didn't start with time is because I feel like if I started with time, knowing the distance, don't write this down, I would have to use this equation. And that means that I got to get out a fancy calculator because in order to solve for the time, when you know the initial velocity, uh, we don't have the uh, capabilities of doing that without fancy calculators, right? It's going to be a quadratic equation. If you are going to do it without a calculator, you have to complete the square. The problem with completing the square is that we have really ugly terms there. It's not like a math class where they give you easy terms for completing the square. So don't start with that. They didn't tell us we had to do it in any particular order. Let's instead go with what's the V right there. The V right there is based on, how about if we say V squared, can I call this V up? Let's put a little up arrow for that one. So the velocity on the way up is equal to the initial velocity plus two AS. All right, so 15 squared, that's a squared, this didn't come out very good. 15 squared plus two times negative 9.8 times 10. And then don't forget to square root that to find out what the V up is. Uh, I don't want to get out my calculator. Mine came out to be that V up is 5.4. Okay, so it slowed down from 15. It slowed down to 5.4 meters per second, which means it's still on its way up past the observer, and it's going to come back down. So let's take advantage of another easy question then. The velocity when it gets back down to the observer has to also be 5.4. Symmetry of the problem. Take advantage of the easy ones. Now we want to figure out some times. So the first thing I'll do, so we'll, I don't know if I really have, I was going to label this A, B, C, D. Let's not do that. Let's call this just T up. So what is the time up? Well, now that I figured out the velocity up, I don't need to use that red equation up there. I can instead use VF equals VI plus A times T up, right? So I can plug in 5.4 equals 15 plus negative 9.8 times t. You get that t up equals 1.53. Is that right? Let me make sure on that. Oh, I went the wrong direction with my sentence here. That's t top. t up was 0.98. I was going to say, I've seen this question so many times in my life now that that didn't sound right. It is 0.98. 0.98 seconds. Okay, now the symmetry of the problem says that 0.98 seconds has to do something with over here too. The problem is, and I'm going to make my picture look ugly right now, so I don't know if I recommend you drawing this on yours and being confused. I know that this much time is 0.98 seconds. That means I know that this much time is also 0.98 seconds, right? Because that's the symmetry of the problem. I don't know anything about the time from here to here. And there's my issue. That's why this is an AP worthy question. It's this part right here is to figure that out. Okay, now, if you were, if you haven't looked at this question ahead of time with the notes, but you did notice on here that I kept talking about 1.53, that's because what I can figure out is I can figure out how much time it takes just to get to the top because uh, that's within our wheelhouse. We know how to solve for that. And then what I know about that is the time it takes to get to the top is 0.98 seconds plus something more to equal that time. Whatever that something more is, then that something more is the time it takes to get from the top down to the observer again. So all I got to do is add together this total time going up plus this time coming back down, and I'm now at the point where I'm at the observer again. That's a difficult question. Very, very difficult. So to get the T to the top, I would probably fall back on VF equals VI plus AT. I'll call this T to the top this time. Zero, not 5.4, equals 15 plus negative 9.8. If you forget that negative sign, the equation will forgive you because it will just come up to be a negative time. It's we know there's no such thing as negative time, not in classical physics. I think I said 1.5, didn't I? Yeah, 1.53 seconds, okay? So it took 1.53 seconds to go up. It takes 1.53 seconds to get back down. 
So why don't we just take that total, which would be 3.06, and subtract out a 0.98 from that to get back to here. So, um, so T total equals 3.06. Then we'll just subtract 0.98 from that. And instead of me writing it all down, it comes out to be 2.08 seconds to get back to that spot. All right. That was chapter 3.4, I think is the name of the section. Uh, you have chapter three homework number five to do as one of your two homework assignments tonight. The second homework assignment you have tonight deals with what's called projectile motion. And you might've noticed that that's what your next lab is, is that you're gonna have a projectile motion lab to, to do. I haven't written it yet, but by the time you get to these notes, it will be written. Okay, so here's the thing about the projectile motion. Um, we're gonna have two movements that are independent of each other, but they're going on at the same time. I'm gonna repeat that. We have two movements that are going on, but they're independent of each other. In other words, they don't affect each other. When gravity pulls something down, it doesn't care if an object just falls straight down or if an object is going in the parabolic path of a, of a projectile and is basically doing this instead, right? Gravity is only affecting its straight down nature. It's not affecting its sideways nature. Its sideways nature is controlled by what fired it out horizontally in the first place. So what it's doing horizontally, which would be something like this, this motion here straight across is independent of this motion here straight down. It's just that the two things are happening simultaneously such that the object follows this path that we see here in the middle, okay? Now I've got this nicely drawn out in slides here, but I was kind of thinking that I could try to demo this for you because this is what I would show you in class. Uh, Mythbusters does a great one on this too. They actually fire like a 22 rifle, which we know travels like a mile as a distance for the bullet. And they want to see if it's true that where it hits the ground way out away is equal to where a bullet drop hits the ground right, in, right next to them. Right, so Mythbusters does physics experiments on steroids. We're not doing that. What we're doing instead is we're looking at the fact that I have right here is a little toy dart gun, and on this dart gun is a paper clip. So what we can say is that um, you know this is kind of like one of those uh, inertia things, which is coming next chapter. That if I fire this dart gun, as the dart comes flying out of here the dart is moving so fast that the paper clip slips off of the dart the dart slips out from underneath the paper clip and the paper clip falls straight down so simultaneously something is dropping which is the path of what you see in the picture right now while something is following the parabolic path okay now it might be hard for you to see this because of the fact that we're in a classroom here or we're, we're doing it in a virtual classroom but if i fire this maybe what you're looking at is you're looking at when you see the dart hit the table, and hopefully with this, you know, $35 uh, web camera, you can hear the paper clip hit the ground over here. If not, I'll just verify that it's true. Okay, now that would have been perfect, except for that I missed the table. Maybe that's why I don't own guns, is because I don't feel like I'd be very good shooting them anyway. Um, oh, sorry. I've also got this tennis ball out here because what I was also going to do was roll the tennis ball on the table. But as I'm sitting here with this, I don't really think that has any validity to our problem. If I roll the tennis ball, how on earth am I ever going to roll the tennis ball at exactly the same speed that I'm shooting the, the dart at? I just don't think it can be accomplished. I don't think that I am uh, skilled enough. But if I did do it, right, not even close. But at least those two things hit the ground at the same time. But what I was going to try to say, we'll just call it a thought experiment, is that the tennis ball rolling across the table is rolling with the same um, horizontal velocity that the dart is traveling through the air. It's just that the dart is falling because of gravity. So we can say all of these three objects, the paperclip, the ball, and the dart, the only thing that unifies them together is time. Okay? All of the things happen in the same amount of time. So in, I've just got it arbitrarily as four seconds, an object is going to fall a distance. Now notice what the way the equation is written there. It doesn't say VIT plus one half AT squared. It doesn't need to. 
excuse me, sorry, a hiccup. Because in the vertical direction, if something is dropped, it has no initial velocity. So the VIT term goes away. On the flip side, if we shoot something straight across, let's pretend we had a gravity switch and we could turn gravity off for a little bit, that an object will travel in four seconds straight out a distance based on the initial velocity that the cannon fires it, right? So we have two things that are going on independent of each other. And if we try to tie them both to each other, you can see here how the black balls line up there with each of the on each side. Now, if you're following these slides online, you're getting a much better view of this really because I actually broke this down into like four slides where you can see the ball each of the spots and there's arrows pointing and explaining stuff that's going on. I don't know. I don't need that, but I've also done this forever. You need to know that the two motions that represent, I should have probably been color coded these as like blue and green, that they are going on simultaneously, but they don't affect each other such that together they put the object at each of these locations on the way down. Okay. So in blue, that's this direction. No, oh, those are supposed to be blue. We have these going on. And then in green, we have these going on. And you can see the equations that match up to those down here. Okay. Another thing that's kind of interesting about this is, did you notice that these are really the two terms of S equals VIT plus one half AT squared? That this right here is the horizontal motion of the ball, and this right here is the vertical motion of the ball. So this would be nice. We could just tie these both together and put them all into one equation and solve for S. But you can't do that because the problem is, is that implies a movement that is um, the is the adding of the two components and put something like this and that's not where the object is located the object is located above that line until gravity has affected the ball speed so much that it starts you know becoming a real true parabola and it's going down faster than it's going over so linking these together in one equation it don't work what we say in class is that if anybody on their chapter test for the projectile motion problem puts both of these together in this equation on the test, that the day after the test, we make all of you come up here and sit on my counter while everybody else in the room gets to spend three minutes pointing at you and laughing. All right? We don't actually do that because too many people do it on their test. And the kinds of people who do it on their test are the kind of people who already get laughed at too much, feel like they're getting ridiculed for their um, their ability sometimes, right? That'd be rude. Don't do it. Do it right. Especially for you guys this year, because you have uh, your notes in front of you. I can't stop you. But by the AP test, uh, you, we probably will be back to normal. So I would be prepared that you have to be able to do this without it. And when we're getting ready for the AP test, you're going to be taking a whole bunch of final exams. And this question comes up over and over and over again. We can tie this to everything. There was a student I had years ago, a real nice kid named Devin. I imagine by now he's probably a doctor or a lawyer or some kind of white collar person out there somewhere. Super nice kid in a classroom of really, really smart people. And he always joked about whenever I would say something like this, he would always end and he'd say, and then it went into projectile motion because we can make any physics problem end with part B projectile motion. So make sure you do it. How much time is it? Okay, a youngster hurls a ball horizontally, that's important, at a speed of 10 meters per second from a bridge. How much time elapses until it hits the water? So even though the ball is gonna do this to hit the water, we don't really have a way to solve that. I mean, there are equations that will solve for the uh, where you are on a parabola. They're called parametric equations. We don't like to do those, they're too difficult. What's easier is to take advantage of the physics symmetry that we have, that if the object is is dropped at exactly the same time that it's uh, hurled horizontally, it'll still hit the ground right here next to the edge of the bridge at the same time that it hits way over here away from the bridge. All right. So to solve for this distance for part A, we just do simply S equals, I'm going to write out the whole thing, VIT plus one half AT squared. Then I'm going to cross this out. There's no initial velocity in the vertical direction. This 10 here is about horizontal direction. We use that to figure out the distance it goes. We're gonna call that 
the green S in the X direction. That's part B. For part A, we're still in the blue. 50 equals one half of 9.8 times T squared. Then we solve for T. I got 3.2 seconds. Okay, so if it's in the air 3.2 seconds falling straight down, then it's also in the air 3.2 seconds to hit right here. But you know what else? It's also in the air 3.2 seconds if we had a way to control gravity, that's what the tennis ball was for, and have it just go straight across. That it's going to get to the same distance straight out for part B, S in the X direction equals V in the X direction times T. So we have an initial speed of 10 meters per second. We have a time of 3.2 seconds because that unifies the entire thing. And that means it's going to go a distance of 32 meters is where it hits the ground way over here, right? That's our S in the X direction. What is the velocity just before it hits the water? That question doesn't come up very much. So I don't know, you could almost disregard this and turn this off now and move on to your homework assignment. You don't have this on your test. The speed that it hits the water is why those pictures showed two vectors in the picture, right? The velocity that it hits is the combination of those two velocity components. The V in the X direction, which was 10 the entire time, it's still 10. The V in the Y direction though, or I'm sorry, yes, the V in the Y direction, that we have to determine that because the two of those together combine to give us our V at the diagonal. So to figure out what the V in the Y direction is, I'll just go back over here to the object that is dropped because they both will achieve the same vertical component of speed in 3.2 seconds. So I would use the equation VF equals VI plus AT, which means 9.8 VI is zero times 3.2 is roughly 32. I probably have it written out 31.4. 31.4 meters per second, 0.4 meters per second. So that's the speed here, it's 31.4 meters per second. So that means that the final speed is equal to the um, Pythag of those two vectors, 10 squared plus 31.4 squared, which came out to be 33 meters per second. I wouldn't spend too much time worrying about part C. It's not on your chapter test. It doesn't show up on the AP uh, FRQs that we do periodically throughout this year. So it's just really not that important. Okay. Thank you for your time. Um, and I will see you in the next video.